The next statement came from Baker, James Baker, the Secretary of State, who said, we're not there for oil, we're not there for, to defend Kuwait, it's jobs. We're there for jobs. Then at a press conference, Bush said, and I quote, some people just don't get the message. It's not oil. It's not to defend Saudi Arabia, and it's not jobs. We're there to prevent this kind of naked aggression. Now I submit to you that if the President of the United States and the Secretary of State don't know why the hell we're there and they change their mind every minute, that none of the above is true. The truth is, a legal precedent has to be established that says that the United Nations is the ruler of the world. It has to be a legal precedent that all nation states submit to the will of the United Nations and give up their sovereignty to the United Nations and submit to the rule of the law of the world, which is the United Nations Charter and the resolutions passed by the United Nations and the United States military is acting as the police force for the United Nations to establish that legal precedent. And Bush has said on television, no nation can ever again stand against a world united. And if they try it, the same thing will happen to them. Margaret Thatcher was the last world leader who was opposed to the one world government. And she is no longer the Prime Minister of England because of that. I'm going to tell you now that the only obstacle to the New World Order coming together at this moment is the right of the American people to keep and bear arms. That is why there is such an effort to take your guns away from you. You see, the intent of the Second Amendment, the second article in Amendment to the Constitution, was not so that we could go hunting. It was not to protect the possessions in your home or to protect you from burglars. The intent of our forefathers in establishing the second article in amendment to the Constitution was that as long as every American owned a weapon, whether they ever fired it or not, our government could never oppress us just with the knowledge that we all had that weapon in our closet. That's the reason. That's why every time you see a bill to take weapons away from the American people defeated in Congress, four more are introduced immediately. It's a never-ending battle. That's why they lie about the statistics. The truth is, in a town where everybody owns a weapon and everybody knows it, there is almost no crime. I'm going to show you this next videotape while you're thinking about that to show you that these craft do in fact exist. This was taken above the Nevada test site. This is what's called a cigar-shaped craft. They are very large. They're also called motherships. Every time they're seen, except in this photograph, usually you see other smaller craft exiting and entering these craft, like scout ships or something. I don't know what you would call it. Uh, but it's absolutely incredible. This piece of footage you're going to see is so rare. I've, I've only seen one other uh, piece of film footage on this particular type of vehicle, uh, and it wasn't even one-third as good as what you're going to see here. So what you're going to see is extremely rare, um, and you'll probably be a long time before you ever see any footage like this again. It's very difficult to get. Go ahead. There's no sound. Kill the lights, please. Now you can see the craft just below the tip of the white cloud. And if you watch, it's going to move from right to left and then turn into the clouds and disappear.
we were approximately 15 miles from that location when this footage was taken. Which means that what you're looking at there is approximately two to three miles in length. That's very impressive, and to me it's very exciting that someone can make something that flies in the air that's two to three miles in length. That is the actual time that you see there, those are the actual seconds passing. Chief of Staff of Intelligence Office of the Commander of the Pacific Fleet. 
Enman was the director of Naval Intelligence from 1974 to 1976 before moving on to become the vice director of the Defense Intelligence Agency. You can see what he did? I mean, he skipped over some pretty senior people and he's going right straight to the top. And only people who are considered to be of the inner circle do that. He became the director of the National Security Agency in 1977, holding that post until 1981 when he attained the rank of admiral and became the deputy director of the Central Intelligence Agency. He retired from government service in 1982 and became the CEO for MCC. Remember what I was telling you about implants? Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation. MCC is a private sector joint venture supported by and share funded by the government and corporate shareholders. The venture was motivated by the Japanese fifth generation artificial intelligence computer project. Yes, yes. <coughs> this is a letter from Bob. Remember I told you Bob Swan was the one who talked me into going back after I went AWOL. Later, I got married on uh, June the 2nd, 1972. On June the 1st, 1972, I sat down with Bob and a bottle of scotch and I told him everything I knew and gave him a set of documents to prove it. Bob acknowledges that conversation in this letter. He acknowledges what I told him about alien installations on the moon, about the Kennedy assassination, um, about the fact that I gave him documents that were highly classified, and he says that he doesn't know what happened to them, he doesn't have them anymore, and it's exactly what he should say. Next. And next. This is a document uh, known as the Eisenhower Briefing Document. It was uh, brought out by a research team of Moore, Chandray, and Friedman. William Moore, with Charles Berlitz, wrote a book called The Roswell Incident, which was the first legitimate work on the so-called crash with the flying saucer near Roswell, New Mexico, in 1947. This document is a fraud, and I can prove it to you very easily. But it has a lot of truth in it. In fact, the document itself reads as if it were taken right out of Moore's book, The Roswell Incident. All of the designations on it are legitimate. Top secret and magic was the same designation given to the material that I saw when I was with Naval Intelligence. Magic means magi controlled. Magi is the majority agency for joint intelligence, which reports only to a top secret group called Majesty 12, also known as Majority 12. It is made up of 19 members. There are six from government, six from the Executive Committee on the Council on Foreign Relations, six from the Jason Scientific Group administered by the MITRE Corporation and Dr. Edward Teller. This briefing document calls it Operation Majestic 12. The documents that I saw said that it was Operation Majority. Also look at the date, 18 November 1952. Eisenhower was not yet president, and if this is truly one of the highest held secrets in this country, he would never have been exposed to this information until he actually took the oath of president. He was not even in government service at the time he was elected. He was the president of a college. Next, please. I can tell you that of those listed there, those names, Admiral Roscoe Hillencoder was the director of the CIA when this, um, when this uh, group was supposedly formed, if in fact it was formed at that time, he would have definitely been a member. Secretary James B. Forrestal, according to the documentation that I saw, was a member and was the man responsible for the operation of the recovery of the craft at Roswell, New Mexico. And it is really his story that is outlined in Whitley Strieber's book called Majestic. The main character in that book was an abductee, carried the bodies from the crash site to Los Alamos National Laboratory. In the documentation that I saw, that actually did happen to James B. Farsaw. Next slide, please. 
And next slide. I'm not, we don't have time to go through every sentence and every paragraph, so I'm just going to hit the major points. Next. Next. On this page, you can see, uh, without any doubt, that this document is a fraud. In uh, enumeration of attachments, you'll see attachment A, special, special classified executive order number 092447 TS slash EO. TS is top secret, EO is executive order. Executive orders are numbered consecutively from president to president, from executive order to executive order, no matter who occupies the White House for the purpose of continuity and record keeping. Truman wrote executive orders in the 9,000 range. Eisenhower wrote executive orders in the 10,000 range, and so on and so forth. President uh, Nixon wrote in the 11,000 range, and some of the ones that he wrote were actually signed by Carter. This is 92,447. Any way that you look at it, it can only be a date. Zero, nine, which would be what month? September, September the 24th, 1947. Executive orders are not listed by date, they are listed by number. Next slide, please. This is a memorandum for the Secretary of Defense. This also is a fraud. Next slide, please. This is legitimate. This came directly from the National Archives. It is legitimate. Uh, one thing that makes it important it is it does mention NSC, National Security Council, slash MJ-12 Special Studies Project. In the documentation that I saw, Majesty 12, also known as Majority 12 for security reasons, where it got the name Majority 12 is that they had to have a majority of 12 votes to carry on any motion or any operation or anything that they wanted to do. If they didn't have 12 votes, they couldn't do it. It was abbreviated MJ-12. I also saw documents that there was a special studies group made up of scientists and uh, prominent people belonging to a secret society called the Jason Society, which actually makes up the core of the Council on Foreign Relations, and under them is a Jason Scientific Group administered by the Miter Corporation to study all the facts, lies, evidence, disinformation of the alien question and arrive at what the truth was. It was a three-year study. Dr. Zbigniew Brzezinski headed the study group for the first 18 months. The second 18 months was headed by Dr. Henry Kissinger. During that time, Dr. Henry Kissinger, this is historical record, wouldn't even speak to anyone. He was gone, get up early, he'd leave, he'd come back very late at night, didn't talk to anybody, didn't care about anybody. He was so engrossed in whatever he was doing that it was like he was living in another world. His wife actually divorced him for this. So it fits. If he was really studying the alien question, I think that's the only thing that I can think of that that would engross me so much that I would neglect my wife. Something of such historical and, and monumental consequence as that. Next slide, please. This, uh, nobody knows if this is real or not, but this is one of the documentation that Moore, Shannery, and Friedman came out with. Next slide. This is a letter um, from Jesse Marcel, Jr. In the Roswell crash in 1947, uh, Major Jesse Roswell was a, an intelligence officer attached to Roswell Army Air Force Base, and he was the one who was sent out to check out this wreckage that Mr. Brazel reported on his ranch. When he got there, he determined that this wasn't anything he'd ever seen before, didn't know what it was, he gathered it all up, put it in his car, took it home, showed it to his wife and child at night, and the following morning took it into the base. That night, when he showed it to his child, his child, Jesse Marcel Jr., interpreted that this was a was pieces of a flying saucer. 
I don't know if his father told him it was a flying saucer or not, but I believe that the suggestion was probably planted in the kid's mind because the only thing that the father had was bits and pieces of stuff that looked like tin foil from cigarette packs and um, uh, balls of I-beams, although they weren't balls, it was some kind of metal, but they were very light. Next slide. In this letter, he recounts that he saw the pieces and it wasn't the remains of any kind of aircraft that he knew of and that he thought it was a flying saucer. Next slide. This is the results of an interview from Jesse Marcel himself, the father. The father goes through and he makes several interesting points. He said that he was familiar with all air activities and it was not a weather balloon, nor an aircraft, nor a missile. It was something else and we didn't know what it was. There were just fragments strewn all over the area, about three quarters of a mile long and several hundred feet wide. We proceeded to pick up the parts of whatever it was and load it in the vehicles. It was one thing obvious to me that whatever it probably exploded above the ground and was strewn over the ground, traveling in a easterly direction, probably northeast to southwest. We filled the vehicles and then proceeded to come back home to Walker Air Force Base, which is now called, or was then called, um, Roswell Army Air Force Base, where I was stationed, and that's how it was. Now notice that Jesse Marcel, the father, doesn't say that that was a flying saucer. He just says he didn't know what it was. And that's significant, and it's never been pointed out before. Everybody cites this letter as proof that he picked up pieces of a flying saucer, and that's a lie. He doesn't say that anywhere in this interview. Next page. And he goes on here, and he talks about the metal and the pieces and what it did. He said they tried to burn it, could not be burned. Uh, would not burn. The same with the parchment we had. Uh, the metal was so thin, just like the tinfoil in a pack of cigarette paper. I didn't pay too much attention to that at first until one of the boys came to me and said, you know that metal that was in there? I tried to bend that stuff and it won't bend. I even tried it with a sledgehammer. You can't make a dent on it. And he talks about some other things that they did. But nowhere in here is significant does he ever say that it was a flying saucer or an extraterrestrial craft. He just says he doesn't know what it was. Next slide, please. And even here, he doesn't say or venture any guess as to what it was. Next slide. This is a letter. This is called the Smith Memo. Smith uh, was a radio engineer for the government of Canada. He came down to Washington to see if he could get the United States government to participate in electromagnetic experiments and experiments involving radio waves and other things of that nature. While he was there, he read a book written by Frank Scully called Behind the Flying Saucers, and he wanted to know if it was real. Scully in his book had said that the government had recovered crashed flying saucers and was hiding this from the public. He went to his embassy, the Canadian embassy in Washington, and asked them to find out the truth. The Canadian embassy contacted Dr. Robert Sarbacher, who was a senior scientist working for the Pentagon at that time. And if you'll give me the next slide, this is what Dr. Sarbacher told the Canadian embassy, and they related to Wilbur Smith. A, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher than even the H-bomb. B, flying saucers exist. C, their modus operandi is unknown, but concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. D, the entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. Again, no mention of extraterrestrial or alien beings. And as you're going to see later, yes, flying saucers did exist. Next slide, please. This is the rest of the Smith memo. It's important that you see the signature and the official stamps and the classifications that were on this thing. It is now declassified. Next slide. At the same time that the government was denying that they were interested in flying saucers or that flying saucers were real or that they were investigating or anything, this poster 
was on the bulletin boards of Air Force bases everywhere. I remember seeing this for many years on bulletin boards where my father worked. And it says, the first thing up there, UFO serious business, and outlines the fact that every base must have an officer designated to specifically investigate UFOs and report the evidence. And down here, it tells him what he has to have. One of the things is a Geiger counter, a magnifying glass. I don't know what he's going to do with that. And uh, have a source for containers in which to store samples. Camera, binoculars and other things. Next slide, please. This is a news release. At the same time that poster was on the bulletin boards of Air Force bases, the Air Force was issuing news releases saying that we're not investigating flying saucers, there are no such thing, what you're seeing is weather balloons, and we don't even want to know about it. Next slide. And next, that's the last of it. One of the things they did though, that last one, I should have held it there, but that's okay. Um, they said that, uh, you know, it's possible it could be a foreign country experimenting from, with some weird aircraft flying over our airspace, but of course they couldn't possibly be doing that. Next. At the same time, this poster was also on military bases, and one was the winner of Poster of the Month. Next slide. These are cows. <laughs> but I wanted to show you what they look like in case some of you haven't been out in the city in a while. <laughs> Next slide. You know, in some cities that I go to, uh, there's really a reason for doing that. <laughs> I wanted to show you this. There is something happening with this phenomenon that is absolutely incredible. Everywhere on this slide where you see an M, there has been a classic case of cattle mutilation. I'm going to describe to you what a classic case of cattle mutilation is so that you will know in your mind what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the lips on one side of the face gone, the jaw, the flesh, and the muscle on the lower side of one of the jaw, lower jaw, gone, stripped to the bone. The tongue missing, one eye missing, one ear cord out and missing. Usually a six inch diameter patch of skin somewhere on the animal has been cut out. Uh, if it's a cow, either the entire udder or a portion of the udder is missing. The rectum is poured out in a perfect cone shape. The sexual organs are always missing. If the cow is pregnant, sometimes the fetus of the calf is gone, but the fetal bag is not open or cut and has not been invaded in any manner. Now that's incredible. But the most significant thing is that all the blood is drained from the animal's body with no vascular collapse and there is not a drop of blood anywhere. There are no cigarette butts on the ground, there are no tire tracks, there are no shoe prints, there are no footprints, there are no gum wrappers, there is nothing. The government says that coyotes did that. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to pretend that I know who or what it was, but I do know one thing, it wasn't coyotes. And I also know that our medical personnel with the best surgical tools at their disposal cannot make or duplicate the same cuts that are bloodless that seem to be literally between the cells. There is no blood in any of the wounds. There are always two holes in the neck of the animal. Now, we got very curious about why would these specific parts of the animals be missing? And we came up with some things that are very interesting. Dust collects in the air. Things that float around in the atmosphere collect in the air. The lips touch the grass and the earth, so does the lower jaw. The eyes exposed to the atmosphere. 
The rectum is where most of the heavy impurities, the things that cannot be digested, that are poison to the system, collect, and that's why people get rectum cancer and colon cancer from these things. The sexual organs would show genetic damage. And where does radioactivity show up first in a mammal? In the middle. So then we got very interested in where these mutilations occurred, what time of year, which way was the wind blowing, and what was upwind from these locations. And we found in every single instance, there was a nuclear site of some kind, a power plant, a weapons base, uh, a weapons storage installation, weapons manufacturing plant, a testing area, missile stockpile, uranium mines, and tailing piles, waste disposal areas, in every single instance we're upwind from these sites. From that, I deduce that whoever is doing it is trying to find out how much radiation has leaked into the atmosphere, the food chain, and the groundwater, and what is it doing to the living mammals in its path. The fact that they leave these carcasses laying out there is an act of terrorism. Literally. I mean, if you want to check for something in these animals, that's fine. But there's no reason why you couldn't take it somewhere else, chop it up, dispose of it, or eat it, or whatever. Why is it being left on the ground? That's an act of terrorism. It's done intentionally to scare people. Why? Maybe to create an alien threat from outer space. Maybe because aliens don't eat beef. <laughs> Next slide, please. Sometimes these are seen in the sky, all the areas where these things occur. Next. Sometimes it's these things with something going up and down from them. Next. Sometimes these things are found, they're being found all over England. One of the incredible things about the crop circles in England is they are literally a vestige of some kind. There's a book called The Father of Lies. In the back of that book, it gives an example of the, the cipher that the secret societies used in ancient times to communicate with their members so that people who were not initiates would not learn the secrets of the society. The symbols of their cipher match exactly the crop circles found in the ground in England. Now this was by accident that I ran across this. There's a woman in California who lives in um, Victorville who is a wonderful woman, discovered this. She had been looking at pictures of crop circles. She had the book, Father of Lies, and she was reading the book, and it struck her all at once. These are the same. And so she let us know, and we have verified it. They are exactly the same. Secret societies have a lot to do with what's going on, believe me. Next slide. Sometimes these things are seen. Next slide. Always they find this. Next. <laughs> then we got to wondering, gosh, all through history there's records of people and animals being found with the blood sucked out of them. Is this the source of vampire legends? We back through history, we found that there are accounts of animals and humans who have been mutilated in this classic manner. Next slide, please. This is some of the information a man by the name Bill English has released. It is some of the exact information that I saw while I was in naval intelligence. He was working as a, um, well, he was working in England at a national security agency listening post, really. And he saw the same documents there. Next slide. This is uh, UFO uh, observer's instruction sheet, 
uh, from the Air Technical Intelligence Command, which tells you how to report UFOs at a time when the United States Air Force said they were not reporting UFOs, didn't care about UFOs, they didn't exist. Next. Next. It's all official Air Force forms. Next. 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 Now this is part of Air Force Regulation Number 200-2 Alpha, Unidentified Flying Objects Intelligence. Now this is significant. The Air Force is not supposed to lie to us, but they were telling us, no, UFOs do not exist. We're not interested in UFOs. There is no evidence of UFOs. And anybody who says they say a UFO is crazy. We don't care about UFOs. Yet they have written a US Air Force regulation called 200 2. And this says on the cover sheet direct communication is authorized between ATIC and other Air Force activities in matters pertaining to UFO investigation. Specifically, the ATIC may call upon the commander of the 1127th Field Activity Group, Fort Belvoir, Virginia, to conduct further field investigations if review of the initial report indicates such a requirement. In this event, the headquarters, 1127th U.S. Air Force Field Activity Group, will prepare the final report by order of the Secretary of the Air Force, Thomas D. White, Chief of Staff. Next page. This tells how to report it, what forms to use, identifying information, weather and winds, comments of preparing officer classification, time and date of sighting, manner of observation. Next. General information. Releasing information. That's funny. Releasing information, it says under here. All information of releases concerning UFOs, regardless of origin or nature, will be released to the public or unofficial persons or organized by the Office of Information Services Office of the Secretary of the Air Force. This includes replies to correspondence except congressional inquiries submitted direct to ATIC and other Air Force activities by private individuals. Exceptions. In response to local inquiries resulting from any UFO reported in the vicinity of an Air Force base, information regarding a sighting may be released to the press or the general public by the commander of the Air Force base concerned only if it has been positively identified as a familiar or known object. <laughs> Next, please. And it goes on, but we just don't have the time. This is how to report one that moves around in the sky. Next. 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 People always ask me, why don't they just fly around the White House? <laughs> well, there's a UFO. This photograph was taken in the early 50s, and that's certainly the White House. Next uh, slide. Those are not butterflies. The truth is, in the early 50s, there was extensive UFO activity in the immediate area of the White House on an almost nightly basis over a long period of time. It is in the headlines of the newspapers. Pilots were scrambled in their aircraft to go and get them out of the airspace around the White House because it's prohibited airspace. And every time they would scramble again in their planes, take off, the UFOs would disappear. The pilots would go back and land, the UFOs would come back. This kept happening night after night after night until the pilots got so disgusted and so frustrated they wouldn't even get in their planes anymore. Next slide. This is another, uh, this is 200 2 identified flying objects UFO. This is the rest of it. Go ahead, next. All Air Force regulations. Next. Okay, I told you earlier about implants. Let me show you where these implants are being found in human beings. I don't know who's putting them there. The people who are being abducted are telling us that they are alien extraterrestrial beings from outer space. 
They all tell the same story. They all describe the craft exactly the same. They all describe the beings in the craft the same. They all have uh, describes the same things that have not been made public knowledge and they don't know each other. And these are people from all around the world. One of the best abductee researchers that I know is here in this room with us, Robin Coyle. One of the, one of the uh, implants is inserted up through the nose and is lodged next to the optic nerve in this region. Another implant is inserted beneath the skull cap next to the medulla oblongata in this region. Another implant is found subcutaneously behind usually the right ear and can be seen and felt. I always like to watch everybody feel behind their right ear when I say that. <laughs> implants have been found in the wrist, in the calf, and in the lower arm. Next slide. Now, this is very strange because just before these began happening and after we began finding these implants, we began noticing newspaper articles like this. Computer chip implants can help find lost pets, and it goes to outline how this happens. And it tells us that the sheriff's department and the police department in the cities are given electronic equipment to communicate with a satellite that the government has put up. And if you put an implant in your pets, the satellite can find your pet wherever it is when it's lost, and your local law enforcement people, by tuning into this satellite with their electronic equipment, and tell you where your pet is and go get it. <laughs> then, next slide please. Then you hear Dan Rather on the six o'clock news say that the pet implant program has worked so well that 97% of all lost pets that have been implanted are being found and returned to their owners that you should have your children implanted. He said this in 1989. Then you see in the Los Angeles Times, not the National Enquirer, ladies and gentlemen, the Los Angeles Times on 12-12-89, forecasts 10 changes for the coming decade, and one of those 10 changes, number four in fact, will become necessary in the future with the availability and widespread use of electrical and chemical implants that will allow 24-hour day control of individuals' behavior. Now are you beginning to get interested in the abductee experience? I hope that you are. You might be next. Next slide. Uh, this is just a letter to me from another researcher, next slide, who sent me this. It's in my book. It's the Foreign uh, Broadcast Information Service, Foreign Press Note. The Foreign Broadcast Information Service is a division of the Central Intelligence Agency, which monitors foreign broadcasts on radio, television, military, civilian uh, broadcast waves, and gleans information. This entire report each paragraph is a separate report of flying saucer or UFO reports in the Soviet Union during the period covered by this report, and this report was issued 22 November 1989. You never heard of any. Every paragraph. One of these paragraphs refers to a crashed craft on a hill from which they recovered pieces of technology that we're not capable of manufacturing. Next page, please. All of these. Now you'll see at the top is what they found up here. You look closer so I can read it. Some of the scientists have concluded that the object that crashed into Hill 611 was an extraterrestrial space vehicle constructed by highly intelligent beings. Doctor of Chemical Sciences B. Vysotsky it's a good thing I'm not Russian, I couldn't talk. Stated that without doubt, this is evidence of a high technology and it is not anything of a natural or terrestrial origin. He cited the fact that the 
Remnants of fine mesh included bits of thin threads with a diameter of only 17 microns, and that these threads in turn were composed of even thinner strands twisted into braids. Extremely thin gold wires were discovered intertwined in the finest threads, evidence of an intricate technology beyond the present capabilities of terrestrial science, according to this man that I can't pronounce his name. Next slide, please. And it continues. Next. Next. And I was marking some of the locations. There's a mark on here somewhere. Right here. There's one of the locations, one of the reports. Next slide. These are some of the others. I didn't mark every one of them, but I marked the important ones in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Next slide, please. This is the first known civilian photograph of a UFO. Next slide. This is a letter, the Gerald Light letter. This letter is absolutely astounding. It confirms everything that I've been saying. Nobody knew that this letter even existed until Bob Exler presented it at the 1989 MUFON Symposium in Las Vegas. He presented the, this on uh, July the 1st. I had already issued my information uh, that this confirms on May the 23rd of the same year. In here, he says, my dear friend, I've just returned from Muroc. Remember I told you Muroc is Edwards Air Force Base now. The report is true, devastatingly true. I made the journey in company with Franklin Allen of the Hearst Papers and Edwin Norse of Brookings Institute, Truman's erstwhile financial advisor, and Bishop McIntyre of L.A. Confidential names for the present, please. When we were allowed to enter the restricted section after about six hours in which we were checked on every possible item, event, incident, and aspect of our personal and public lives, I had the distinct feeling that the world had come to an end with fantastic realism. For I have never seen so many human beings in a state of complete collapse and confusion as they realized that their own world had indeed ended with such finality as to beggar description. Can you get the sense of what this guy had gone through? The reality of other plane aeroforms is now and forever removed from the realms of speculation and made a rather painful part of the consciousness of every responsible scientific and political group. During my two days visit, I saw five separate distinct types of aircraft being studied and handled by our Air Force officials with the assistance and permission of the Ethereans. Notice he calls them Ethereans, which means that he attaches some spiritual significance to them. And notice also that he capitalizes Ethereans, signifying that he may have viewed them as gods. I have no words to express my reactions. It has finally happened. It is now a matter of history. President Eisenhower, as you may already know, was spirited over to Muroc one night during his visit to Palm Springs recently. And it is my conviction that he will ignore the terrible conflict between the various authorities and go directly to the public via radio and television if the impasse continues much longer. Well, we know that he didn't do that. And it goes on. We don't have time to read it all. It's in my book in the appendix. Those of you who get the book, you can read it at your leisure. Next. This is the second page. Next. <laughs> this is Bishop McIntyre. Next, there's old Ike. Remember the slogan, we like Ike? Ike started this crap. <laughs> <laughs> Next, there he is again. Remember what Ike said to us when he left office? Does anybody remember that? He tried to warn the American people against a group, a powerful group within the defense industrial complex, which might seize unwarranted power and destroy this country. And nobody listened to him. Next. I think he would have said a lot more, but he didn't want to die. Was this one of the little guys he met? Or is this for our entertainment? Nick? Is this one of the little guys? 
Now this is a very well known photo that's been leaked out to the public. It's been thoroughly debunked by everybody in the world, but it's never been proven false. Never been proven to be a fraud. Nobody knows where it came from. Now I hope you all know what debunked means. Let me show you what debunked means. What's your name, ma'am? No, it's not. What's your name? No, it's not. What's your name? No, it's not. That's what debunked means. Next slide. One of the things that I saw and I talked about earlier was that there was an elite group of scientists called the Jason Group administered by a corporation which at that time was not the MITRE Corporation but is the MITRE Corporation now. I talked about that all over the country. People said, you're crazy. Well, I found reference to them in the Pentagon Papers that were leaked by Daniel Ellsberg. And in the Pentagon Papers, it said that the Jason Group had invented and uh, come up with the electronic barrier that was placed across the DMZ of Vietnam to detect and prevent the North Vietnamese regulars from coming across the border. I was there on the DMZ. It didn't work. So they're not as smart as they think they are. But they do exist. Some people submitted Freedom of Information Act requests and actually got the truth out of the Pentagon. The first official acknowledgement that they exist. We submitted one and got it, but what I'm going to show you is not what I got because people always doubt what I get. So I'm going to show you what somebody else got. Richard Whitmire of the Gannett News Service published this in the Olympian in Washington. And this is what he found. Next slide. He found that these guys are incredible. They have the highest security clearances in the nation. There are several Nobel, Nobel Prize winners in the group. They hold the protocol rank of Rear Admiral, which is two stars, whenever they visit any military installation, ship, airplane, Air Force base, or government facility. They are paid $500 a day uh, consulting fee. And they are literally some of the best brains in this country. Next slide. Next. And these are some of the lists. These are some of, of them. There is only one woman among them. Her name is Claire Max. Let me see if I can find her. I think she's on the next slide. There she is, Claire E. Max, Institute of Geophysics and Planetary Physics, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. What do they need with a planetary physicist in a government consulting group? Next. Next. I always try to point out what's happening with women because I'm very sensitive to women's needs nowadays. Um, I think, really, truthfully, if the world were run by women, we wouldn't be in this situation. Next. <laughs> This is uh, Bob Exler's idea of what the cover-up structure looks like. He believes wholeheartedly that to have a cover-up of this kind involving this kind of technology, you would have to have full support from what we call corporate America. Now, this would be very easy in this country because who is corporate America? It's literally the Council on Foreign Relations. And I'm going to show you later that not only is this possible, it's probably absolutely right on. Next. Next, we've already looked at this. This is a uh, piece of film that was sent to Leonard Strangfield, who is another researcher. Who uh, this, The person who sent this film said that this was an alien extraterrestrial body recovered from a craft that had been burnt. Uh, I've looked at this at every angle that I possibly have, can think of, and I can't tell what in the world it is, except that you can sort of get a sense that it's probably biological something. Next. This was also sent to Leonard Stringfield, and the same thing was purported to be said. They said that this was the burned body of a crashed extraterrestrial being from a crashed spaceship. And this 
this one is a frog. Because right here, under the body, is a pair of Air Force flight glasses. <laughs> I've seen enough of those in my life to know exactly what they are. Next. Yes, the newsreels captured it. We went down to watch Roy Rogers on Saturday morning, and they showed us this thing hopping around the flight line in front of a bunch of reporters in bleachers, and it never went anywhere. It just sort of hopped around, and the pilot had this incredible terrified look on his face. <laughs> Next slide. This is a photograph uh, taken at a junkyard at a, I believe it was White Sands test range. Nobody knows what it is. Uh, looks like a mad welder went wild. Next. This is a photograph. It's supposed to um, be able to learn how well parachutes of different designs work with this thing. Is that true? I don't know. Next. This is another one. We couldn't figure out what this is used for. We compared the shape and the size of this to the known nose cowlings of large aircraft, and we haven't been able to find anything that it fits. But there's a lot of experimental aircraft that you never get to see, so that doesn't mean anything really. Next. These are photographs of three UFOs, or actually four. One's almost out of the photograph up there, over a power plant. They seem to really like power plants. They're seen a lot, especially around nuclear power plants. If my theory about the cattle mutilations is correct, that might explain it. Next slide. February 27th, 1951. Isn't Lassie beautiful? <laughs> Next slide. This advertisement was in this magazine. Flying mobile camper of the future may be electric power plugging into an any electric outlet for recharging. Now this is during the period of time when people like Herman Oberth, the world-renowned rocket scientist who was, who was uh, the teacher to Dr. von Braun, was saying that uh, we couldn't take credit for all the technology that we've developed in the last decade. And when the reporter asked Dr. Oberth, what do you mean? What other nations helped us? He said, what another nation, son? It was those little guys from out there. And security people grabbed him and hustled him right out of the press conference. That was at his retirement. <laughs> it was also the same period of time when William P. Lear, John Lear's father, said on a television talk show when asked what he could see for the future, he said, you will be able to get into a phone booth in Los Angeles and step out in New York City. And he wasn't joking, and the audience laughed at this man. This was one of the big wigs in the defense industrial complex who knew exactly what was being researched in our laboratories at that time. Next slide. And also in this magazine, this science to Richard Wilson exposes flying saucers. He says what they've been saying for day one, they're weather balloons. Next slide. Albert Einstein. If, in fact, extraterrestrials were real and we had recovered that technology, I'm sure that Albert Einstein would have known about it, would have been in on it in one way or another. Next slide. And he may have known about things like this, the proceedings of the Lunar and Planetary Exploration Colloquium. May 13, 1958. Look at that date because it's very significant when you look at what's in this book. And I'm going to show you a few pages. I've got this book at home. I can guard it carefully because it's the only copy that's ever been able to be located. And I've got it. Introduction to the Initiating Group. Scientific Aspects of the Lunar Surface. How did they find that out? The Physical Characteristics of the Lunar Surface. 
the geological aspects of the interior of the moon, evolution and nature of the lunar atmosphere.